right, that must mean go. Okay, we want to welcome everyone that's here this morning, and I see, we are missing a few for those on Zoom also. Welcome. And uh, Lael, thank you. These delicious snacks. That cake is wonderful. Oh, yes. I got to share that recipe. Okay, and we'll start the morning with Deanna's memory verse. For you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve or be slaves to one another. Galatians 5.13. And this is going to lead us into our lesson today. But let's, let's have our prayer first. Our dear Heavenly Father, once again we thank you for this group of Christian friends gathered here to learn more of your word. Thank you for the opportunity to study together. Please be with Deanna as she guides us through the lesson she has prepared. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. And let's silence our phones, too, so we won't be distracted. All right. Thank you. Thank you for reminding us. <laughs> well, good morning. Welcome, everyone. Um, we are in lesson eight of our Galatians series. There are 10 lessons in this series, so we're, you know, heading towards the conclusion, and we're going to see what Paul does with, um, you know, he is moving sections today. We see him transitioning into different kind of materials. Material, and we're going to talk about that. Um, last week, we talked about, um, a, you know, a big theological section. What story did Paul use? Abraham and Sarah. Yes, Abraham and Sarah. And Abraham and Hagar, you know, so that Sarah and Hagar began to represent what? Two covenants, right? And um, Paul associated those covenants um, with... Uh, the a non genealogical um, relationship with each person, right? So we learned all about their story and how Hagar was in the line that led, you know, through Ishmael and not to the Israelites, and Sarah was the line that led to the Israelites who would become the Jews. Um, but Paul said, the, "My Jewish opponent." who are Judaizers, um, they go with who? Hagar. Hagar, right? So he reverses it. There's, a, there's this um, sort of you know, inversion of the story, as we sometimes see with Jesus, as we saw Paul did with the Abraham story. And as we went through the Hagar story, we saw how closely Hagar was identified with the pattern of the Israelites. So it became less surprising that that Paul assigned Hagar to those relying on the Jewish law and Sarah to both Jews and Gentiles who were relying on what? Justified by? Yeah, faith, God's promise, faith that God will fulfill his promise in Jesus Christ, faith in Jesus Christ. So the message out of that is that when we trust God, we become part of the family of God and recipients of the promise of God. So it's the, that same point God made with Abraham that God's promises supersede human ancestry and that being a child of God is for all of us who are willing to trust Jesus. Remember, our faith in Jesus is not intellectual belief only, but a willingness to put ourselves in his hands, to rely on his faithfulness. So one interesting thing I want to take a, a moment to note is that Paul is not mounting an anti-Jewish argument here, right? Have you all watched on the news? In our city, there has been a rise in anti-Semitism, right? It's, it's very disturbing. It's very upsetting. And it's more upsetting to consider that sometimes people have used scripture to justify that kind of hatred and um, targeting of the Jewish people. So is that consistent with scripture? No. Yeah, not at all. So um, there is, I want to just give you a quick starting point in case you have an opportunity to address whether scripture should be used to support those arguments. Um, this is a period of time in which some Jews are in conflict with other Jews about whether the Jewish scriptures are fulfilled in Jesus, right? But what is Jesus? 
nationality wise June. so all of this when we have a time that there is a shorthand which is appropriate to the period and the situation in which we're calling the jews these <laughs> opponents of jesus but all of them were jews at the very beginning right this is this is within the jewish faith that we get this and so um this even to the point in Galatians where we have a disagreement of how Jesus will be followed and whether that includes the Jewish law, we have ethnically Jewish people on both sides of that argument. And so when we say the Jews or the Jewish law or following Judaism, we're using a shorthand that is not meant to um, separate non-Jews from Jews. It's meant to separate believers in Jesus from those who are not believers in Jesus. And how do we feel from those who about those who are not believers in Jesus? Is like, you know, targeting, hatred, any of that? No, instead we would want those as God does want all to come to a knowledge of the truth. You know, there is a love and inclusion of those people too. And so important to <clears throat> consider, you know, your answer for when this comes up, that scripture does definitely not support an anti-Jewish mindset. Questions or comments? I just felt like that has come up too much lately. Um, and we keep saying the Jews, <laughs> or we'll say Paul's Jewish opponents, <laughs> as compared to the Jews and Gentiles who love Jesus. Yeah. Well, in 15, I was just underlining it, but if you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. Yeah, D is reading us. The verse 15, if you keep on biting and devouring one another, you will be destroyed by one another. And so biting and devouring is never within the character of the Christian. No matter who is on the other end, that's not how we act. And we're going to talk about that today, aren't we? Yeah. And, and the great commandment is to love God and love your neighbor. Love God and love your neighbor. Yeah. Not just your Christian neighbor. All of your neighbors. Yeah. And that's the way that you can win them to by the character of Jesus, we win people to Jesus. Yes, absolutely. So just that's kind of a side note, but really it's inherent to everything we're doing here, isn't it? Okay, so, uh, we're, so we're, we're moving out of this big um, section. You know, we did, did the Abraham story. We did this sort of like understanding of what does it mean to be justified by faith in Jesus versus justified by works of the law. We did the Hagar and Sarah story. And so it's been a large sort of deeply theological section difficult passages these are regarded even by scholars um, and you know very learned students of the word as extremely difficult passages and so Paul but Paul has used them to make his argument that you know we well will tell me okay so sometimes this all of this teaching has been boiled down to faith versus works do you think that encapsulates what Paul has been saying in these middle chapters of Galatians? I see some heads shaking. Anyone want to take a stab at what it what might encapsulate these? Are, are you asking the second question about the hope of righteousness? What is my second? I'm not. Okay. Not okay. yet. Okay. Soon. Okay. <laughs> I had to look back and see what my questions were. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm actually just thinking about transitioning us out of these middle chapters because these have been difficult material and sometimes they've been summed up as, oh, these are about faith versus works. And I don't think that really captures what they're about. What do you all think? Yeah. Faith leads to works. Faith leads to works. Yeah, I got to do my clothes too. Ross. <laughs> Like, there we go. Um, so, right. So faith leads to works, which is going to be the point, you know, he's making today, right? So he's not talking about faith versus works. What is he talking about in those chapters? Is it slavery and freedom? Slavery and freedom is a huge contrast he made. 
slavery to having to become a Jew, to become a Christian, slavery to actions that might um, require, uh, we have barely enough chairs, but we can also, um, you can also pull some into the back if we want. Here's one here too. Okay. Yeah, I'm welcome. Okay, so that idea of slavery versus freedom, slavery to what? The old covenant, the old law. Right. Having to um, be a part of the Jewish family to be a part of the family of God. Okay? Freedom to what? To live for Christ, to have the Holy Spirit, to follow your faith. To follow your faith. Right. And so it's so much deeper than just we don't earn our salvation by works. Do we earn our salvation by works? No, and that's in there, right? But there's so much more in there that um, tells us how we function in the family of God, how it is that God's entire story of Scripture has led to us getting to be his heirs and to inherit his promises, beginning with the Holy Spirit. Yeah, it's kind of because of our faith we do. Yes, and that is where we're going. We're getting, the, we're on to the question. Okay, so last week we looked at um, the beginning of chapter five and we talked about how Paul um, addresses like, should you be, is it okay if you go ahead and be circumcised too just for good measure? And the answer was no, we don't go be circumcised just for good measure because that would indicate relying on circumcision. And he was very adamant that that would take us away from the grace of Jesus, right? Um, but we, we didn't go through every part of these verses. So I want us to look at verses five and six in particular. But by faith, we eagerly await through the spirit, the righteousness for which we hope is the NIV, or the, the quote I gave you is the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. Okay, we talked about that. The only thing that counts is faith expressing our, itself through love. Okay, so let's look in particular at these two phrases, the hope of righteousness. What does that mean? What is the hope of righteousness? Justification and righteousness, is that synonymous? Same word, yes, great point. Is justification and righteousness the same? They are the same, yeah. So then we ask, is Paul saying, oh goodness, I hope I can get justified. I hope I can be righteous. Okay, yeah. to, Anne, to, tell, us, tell us more. Well, if I say that become righteous, and we've seen that in other scriptures, and then you get the Spirit, and the Spirit works in you, and works out salvation, and works out the, the, good, the, the good deeds that we do, the works that we do. The good, okay, so we, we are made righteous because we're willing to trust in Jesus, Anne said, and then through the Spirit, that works out into good deeds, good works, acts that are consistent with the character of the Spirit of God, right? And so when we have hope of that, what's our hope? What hope do we have? Being with God, yeah, which a down payment is God in us now, yeah. What else? What's the other part of our hope? How is it a hope of righteousness? That we have forgiveness. That we have forgiveness, because Paul is going to talk about, do we do it perfectly? No. No, and so forgiveness is part of our hope. What else? We're not just forgiven. How, what happens to our behavior? What makes it better? Transformation, it makes it better, right? So that our hope is that our righteousness is increased. And God promises that and gives us the spirit. And so we have this dynamic that is sometimes called already and not yet, right? Showing up in these verses, faith expressing itself through love, right? That you all have already really put your finger on. So that yes, we are justified, 
just by being willing to trust God. And we are, we continue to grow in our justification, righteousness, being made right with God as that, as our faith works out in our actions and in our lives. Well, yes. Faith Sandy. is just kind of like the, the bottom stone, the building block of all of this. Mm -hmm. Okay. You have to start with faith and then all of this. Right. From it. Starts with faith so that faith becomes, is the building block that everything else is built on. That's house built by Jesus, right? You know, not, not by our own selves, but by the spirit. Yeah. Other comments? It's a cool concept. <laughs> Repeat that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we have this idea of that righteousness is our reality into which we will continue to be shaped right? It's both real and it's in increasing and it becomes more and more our reality as we go. And we remember that these Gentile believers, the reason they were vulnerable to this false teaching from Paul's opponents was that they really wanted to do it right, right? That's the only thing that would make them vulnerable. They were willing, to, they're thinking about going and being circumcised, right? Something that is, you know, D dangerous and um, as an adult and in, you know, surgical conditions in the ancient world, um, something painful, something that would be ostracizing in their communities. You know, they're willing to go do something like that because they really want to be in the family of God. They really want to live in God's way. And Paul says, you can. And let me tell you more about that. Linda. Yeah. This, this transition phase that they had found themselves in, you know, the Jews have been rule keepers for centuries, and the rules were the things you followed. It's almost like becoming a teenager, <laughs> and those rules are not quite as strict, and, and you have more freedom to make choices, and it, they're kind of like in that teenage of civilization. Okay, Linda said that um, the Jews have for these generations been rule keepers in following the law. And we did, we saw that Jesus sort of talked to them about that, right? Mm -hmm. He said, that's, that's not what the law is really about, right? And Linda also said, it's almost like moving into a, a teenage phase where you have the rules, but then you're supposed to interpret them. You're supposed to make your own decisions and trying to, to navigate that and the difficulties that go with that. Did I capture your comment well? Right, and, and, and really that's pretty tough to do. I can see why they struggle with it. Yeah, she says that's pretty tough to do. And do and so we, we kind of, you know, to some extent, we mature beyond that. And then there are always areas where I feel like I'm all I'm, I'm in that phase as well, right? Mm -hmm. Like, don't we live there in some ways, all the time, right? And so we're going to speak to that. Yeah, excellent point. Another way they transition, it's a transition, you know, between from the Jews to the Christians. Yes, that transition from the Jewish understanding of how to follow God to a Jesus-led understanding of how to follow God. And it is, um, it's like the Sermon on the Mount, right? Where we get, you know, you've been told not to murder, but I'm telling you don't even hate. Well, it's challenging. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's read Galatians 5, 13 through 18. Let someone read that out loud. Sharon, do you want to do that? Did I see your hand? Oh, thank you. You, my brothers, are called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or it will be destroyed by, you, by each other. You will be destroyed by each other. So I say, live by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not 
do what you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Thank you. Okay. So verse 13, we see that Paul begins by emphasizing their calling. Remember, that's how he opened the letter. If we look back at Galatians 1, 6, we see, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you. Yes, by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. So we have this idea that they were all always called and now he says let me tell you what you were called to be you're called to be free yeah which he has just been emphasizing right he's been saying don't go back to slavery over and over he has said that especially as he developed the child to um coming into your inheritance metaphor and as he developed the hagar and sarah an allegory right a call to be free and now we see he's going to say something about what freedom means in practical terms okay so what does it um let's look at uh verse 16 what is the first part oh no sorry um verse 13 what is the first part what is freedom not for turning back to the uh, fleshly things back to fleshly things okay what other what other translations do y'all have sinful nature Okay, the NIV is going to use sinful nature quite often when the um, original is literally flesh. Um, Paul uses the word flesh 16 times in um, Galatians. And so I like to mark those as flesh because he's doing kind of a design pattern with his choice of vocabulary, right? He's choosing it on purpose. Um, circumcision is fleshly, right? The the obedience to the law is of the fleshly um, approach, you know, the fleshly side of, of faith versus um Works, works of the law versus faith in Jesus Christ, right? Um, and so he says this is not an opportunity for the flesh. flesh. So literally, it's just for the flesh. An opportunity for the flesh. Okay. And this flesh is a key word that keeps showing up, right? So um, Paul says um, in other places in Galatians, remember he said he didn't consult with flesh and blood, but instead um, got his revelation straight from Jesus. He, um, he says flesh will not allow anyone to be justified when he first does that justification thing in 2.16. That's a quote from the Psalms. Before you know flesh will be justified. So he's pulled that word out. Um, he says, we no longer live in the flesh because we live by faith in 2.20. And in 3.3, he says, having begun in the spirit, are you now going to be perfected, finished, matured by flesh? No. Right. So he's used this and he says the son of the slave, born, slave woman was born according to the flesh. That's another one that the NIV translation gives us good meaning, but obscures Paul's um, wordplay that he's using to tie his theme together. Um, so uh, there's like, he, Paul's going to use it eight times more, you know, eight times in chapters five and six, the word flesh. So it's really a key here. And he says, it's not an opportunity for the flesh. What does that mean? Well, if you're free, you're not free to go out and just do anything you want to that's immoral. There, you have the freedom of, to do good things because of your faith and spirit of this. Yeah, so, and what's the other half? He says, let's use it not as a deterrent. Use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Rather, what? Serve others. Serve others. Serve others. Serve others. Serve others. And what is that? I gave you the literal um, translation of serve in your memory verse. What is it? Be slaves, be slaves to. He said over and over, not go back to slavery, but now he says be slaves to one another. Okay. How does that work? 
He just said not to be slaves, and now he says to be slaves. What's happening? <clears throat> to do it by loving others. Out okay. Of love for others. Out of love for others, not slavery that um, makes us try to be something we're not, but slavery that, although maybe we're not very loving to one another. So it's we still are trying to be something we weren't, right? Mm -hmm. So what else? Slavery to Christ. Slavery to Christ, right? This is something that fits with Paul's self-concept. We see over and over in this letter and in his other letters, he says, if I were still trying to please, this is Galatians 1.10, if I were still trying to please men, I would not be a, your translation may say bondservant, literally slave to Christ. Um, we all, we see this in 1 Corinthians 9.19. Um, I think I've, I've put these scriptures up here for you. Um, if I were, for though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all so that I might win more. We have this idea of Paul's um, choice to be subject to others. Um, he says that of his fellow ministry leaders as well. He says, for we, this is 2 Corinthians um, 4, 5, we don't preach ourselves but Christ Jesus as Lord and ourselves as slaves for Jesus' sake. Um, and Jesus, think about Jesus in the great Christ hymn of Philippians. He emptied himself, taking on the form of a, my translation says servant, it is literally slave, taking on the form of a slave being made in the likeness of men. That's in Philippians 2. So that... We see radical self-giving is what we do with our freedom, right? Um, be slaves to one another in the fear of Christ, Ephesians 5.21. And so um, Paul equates this opportunity of the flesh with self-indulgence, whereas our slaves to one another is this radical self-giving love who is our example of radical self-giving love? Jesus. Jesus, right? Jesus loved me and gave himself for me. So, and he said, and, you know, how can this be? Um, verse 14, the entire law is summed up in what? Okay, who summed up the law in love your neighbor as yourself? Jesus. Jesus. Right. And so this is the way of Jesus that he's saying, when you're free, you're free to follow the path that Jesus lived and shows us how to live. Not an easy path. Right. Questions, comments? He also demonstrated that same slave, you know, service. Yeah, they took on the role of the slave literally in the foot washing. Yes. And he, and he said he now showed them the extent of his love. You know, the text points out that that is an example of love. Yeah. What else? Other comments? We talked about how, you know, the, we see the example of the opposite. You know, if you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you'll be destroyed. So the way of Jesus is a way that we're going to see it leads to growth, maturity. But the way of uh, the opposite way, the indulging the flesh is a way of biting and devouring each other that leads to destruction. Okay. Um. Let's look at verses um, 16 through 18. So what is happening here? What happens? Um, you, he says, if you live by the spirit, you won't do gratify desires of the flesh, literally flesh. But what happens? We have a battle. We have a battle. Mm -hmm. What's the battle? Lust, 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 again, lust against the spirit. And um, the spirit against the flesh. The, the, our lusts or sinful desires of the flesh battling against 
what the spirit would have us do. Now, um, some say these verses have to be about someone before they're saved, although, you know, the word saved is never used in Galatians, but, you know, just thinking about it in terms of the whole scripture has to be about someone before they're saved because after we're saved, we have the spirit, right? Is that, does that fit with these verses? Does it fit with our experience? The person who is in the battle has the spirit, don't they? They are already a part of the family of God and have that down payment of their inheritance in the family of God. And yet, the battle rages, right? Um, and if we didn't have choice, if God never gave us choice, there would be no battle. But we do have the spirit and we have a choice whether to acknowledge it or not. Linda says that we, if we didn't have choice, there would be no battle, but we do have the spirit and we have the choice to listen to the spirit and follow its ways. I know I, the, there's the, a kitty is on the screen and we must enjoy the cat while the cat is available to enjoy. I think Paul would agree. Yeah, okay. So let's read, um, someone read for us 19 through 26, please. Yes, there are two long lists. <laughs> the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. Thank you. Okay, so um, I was pulling up a different translation because I saw several points of sinful um, nature. All those are flesh, literally. Yeah. So um, so this, this first thing is um, verse 18, the acts of the... Oh, verse 19, the, the acts or the deeds of the flesh are what? What are they? Obvious, Obvious right? It could be evident. You could translate it. It's um, phaneros. It's the word from which we get um, light, photon. It's, they're, they're lit up. They're, they're clear. They're manifest, right? We can see them. Um, what does Paul so why what what does Paul mean by flesh here? We sort of said that, but then we didn't really answer. Um, sometimes in scripture, flesh refers to just the body. Um, in secular writings, it's sometimes written that way. Um, it can mean the the physical flesh and blood part of a person. Is that how Paul is using it? The sinful acts of human beings. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the sinful acts of human beings. I like that. Acts and, and not just acts. What else? What more than acts? Thoughts. Desires. Desires. Yeah, so we see that the, the NIV translation sinful nature is apt here, right? Because we don't re, we don't mean that our bodies are bad. Does, does, does scripture think that our bodies are the sinful parts of us? No. No. Exactly. We are, you know, the, the Jewish conception of the person, the Christian conception of the person is one of unified, not separate um, spirit and soul and body, but unified spirit, soul, and body who as a whole, follow Jesus. 
right? But we do recognize, this is familiar, right? We recognize that in ourselves, we do have a fleshly nature, a sinful nature, the, um, a nature that leads us contrary to the work of the spirit, right? And he says, why does he say these things are obvious? Are they obvious? Some of them are. Some of them are. Okay, so some people think witchcraft is a good idea, don't they? Sometimes anger is um, elevated in some cultures, possibly including ours. Yeah, Marie? Well, okay, for example, tell me if this was anger and tell me if it was, did I say it before? <laughs> 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 I know we've changed the time because it's really it's my husband, clock, you know, 7.30, and this was somebody, how are you this morning, and you, but look, Carl, Carl, which was, and I said, uh, I was fine until you called and woke me up, <laughs> <laughs> so he hung up, or I hung up, I don't know, and then the next, well, he wasn't going to get a sale, so he was ready to move on, yeah, the next minute or two was a, the phone rang again, and this time is so and so from National Home Services. Uh, but and I said, do you, do you think it's against the law to call people like this at, before nine o'clock in the morning? I think it is. <laughs> and he tried to tell me it was past nine o'clock. It wasn't the same. So we see that <laughs> telemarketing can, can lead to I fits spoke. of rage. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> but this is real, right? We live like, you know, um, what, what are y'all thoughts? What are y'all thoughts? What else? Well, I'm just thinking about what you brought up earlier in the discussion about the, the hatred against the Jewish people in our community. Mm. That's right there. <laughs> yeah. The list. <laughs> yeah, it is in the list. Yeah. And that, but so, you know, um, I don't think of myself as um, anti-Semitic, and I work hard not to be, you know. But there are elements of d different kinds of bias in various situations, whether they be race or other, that, that sneak up on us. We always, you know, all of us, we, we have um, the ability to see the wrongness, and yet we don't always live in the way that we mean to live, right? Right. Well, we might have a bias within us, but most of these show acting it out. Some right. do, yeah. Most of these, you're, the only one I look at is maybe that the envy might be something that you hold inside. It doesn't manifest itself. Mm -hmm. Envy, but what about jealousy? jealousy. Yeah, yeah. And selfish ambition. How about selfish ambition, yeah. right? I think yeah. all of those things come from a lack of trust and fear in your in your hope or your um, all your eggs <clears throat> in the basket rather than in the godly mm -hmm. one, you're you're gonna fail. It's it's inevitable. Yeah. So I think you know we have that tendency to um, push and pull given given whatever circumstance we're in rather than trusting in everything that's ultimately our circumstance. Yeah. Judy's saying how this, um, we see a, a motivation of fear and of self-reliance. Is that fair? Um, a reliance on the human side of things, not a reliance on God that kind of leads us into many of these actions. The envy, jealousy, selfish ambition, those. There's also actions that are just self-indulgent, right? There's several in here. Um, uh, what it, what the NIV calls um, sexual immorality is the word for fornication. Um, we have uh, debauchery, orgies. I mean, orgies sound, I think, far-fetched for many of us in our lives, but this was something that um, would have been a part of some of the pagan celebrations at the time. And certainly in our day, it's not far-fetched for everyone, you know. And so you know, we we see that there are elements of these lists that are outward. There are elements that are inward. Um, all of them 
are harmful to ourselves and others. These all dehumanize in some way. They all lead us away from who we are created to be in Jesus. Carrie. When I look at this list, I think of some of these things are just uh, human nature at base, the kernel of human nature. But it's taken to the nth degree. We've let, lost our control. Uh, we've gone too far in whatever it is. Because some of these things you think about, you know, um, oh, drunkenness, for example. Okay, I can have maybe one glass of wine, but I'm not going to have a whole bottle. You know, there's everything is taken to the nth degree. And we have that we've moved that much farther away from the spirit and from God. Okay. So Carrie is saying how like all of these we see a kernel of like human nature taken to excess or taken outside the boundaries that God would have for us. Is that a fair? So, you know, we see, and we talk about human nature, a lot of times when we say that we're talking about the fleshly nature, right? There's, there's more to human nature than that, right? We are created in the image of God. We are created to be able to recognize the wrongness of these behaviors. Have, do we always train our consciousness correctly? Do we we always recognize the wrongness of wrong behaviors. No, you know, it does take a following of the spirit to have our consciousness attuned to reality. And that is a challenge, but he's in, as he gives this list, he's saying, you see what these destructive behaviors, these are of the flesh. And then, oh, well, I was just curious, the word in, impurity, is there another word that that, you know, the Bible has that clarifies what that means. Uh, let me pull that up. Let me see what word it is. Um, it literally is uncleanness. I don't, I think that's left a little, that might be a little vague for our taste. Yeah. yeah. But I think, so when Paul is saying they're obvious, um, you know, you sort of get this idea that in our life in the spirit, we be, we we are trained more and more. We recognize them. Yeah, I think it's possibly easier to see this in others than in ourselves. Okay, uh, it may be easier to see this in others than ourselves, but we are going to talk. Hold that thought for next week because we are going to um, Paul's going to address that very thing next week and it's quite interesting the the cautions that he gives about it you know like I want you to notice when you you study for next week um, which side of the transgressor equation does he spend more time warning you know so so we'll keep hold that thought Okay, so these are the behaviors that are of the flesh, right? Um, why does Paul say, verse 21, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God? Didn't we already start inheriting the kingdom of God? What's going on here? But we're not following God's teachings if we're doing these kinds of things. But if we're doing these kinds of things is a great point. The word here, um, he says, uh, in NIV, it's those who live like this. Um, let's see. Um, the NASB is those who practice such things. And so the, the translation, what it's trying to capture is that those words are words for ongoing action. When we choose to practice, these are our practices. When we choose to keep living like this, it's a, it's a turning away from our inheritance. If our inheritance is God in us, and we keep saying to the God in us, no, I don't want the godly way. I want to go do the works of the flesh. That we're actually, we're walking away from our inheritance, right? This isn't someone coming in from the outside and saying, you didn't measure up, you don't get the kingdom of God. This is, you're not inheriting it because you're throwing away the inheritance. When we may get forgiveness for these things, but you can't continue, after you're forgiven, you can't continue doing them. <laughs> Although we sometimes well, do, yeah. and <laughs> but the struggle, right? The battle, we continue to have the, the desire to follow the ways of the spirit, right? 
other comments on that? Uh, yeah, I think it's the King James Version says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? <laughs> may it never be. Yes. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? I think it's uh, it's in a different, it's not in Galatians, but it's in Romans, but it's, um, yes. Romans really covers a lot of the same ground as Galatians. It's just so much longer. Um, and it has the other most difficult passages in it. You know, it has some really um, challenging passages, as challenging as our Hagar and Sarah one then. If you, if you were left thinking, I'm not sure I 100% got that, then you are in good company. Um, yeah, so this idea of like, you know, you, you walk away from the kingdom of God. Well, the kingdom of God is the place where God is the king. That's where God's reign exists. The kingdom of God is God's will being done on earth, in my heart, in my life, in my actions, as it is in heaven. And so when I turn around and don't do God's will, that's that's me walking away from the instructions. It seems to me, too, that it's, it's the opposite of what you just said in terms of God being king. And these are me being king or queen. Yeah. Uh, that I am, everything is to suit me, to make me happy, to make me feel better, um, as opposed to others and God and Jesus. It's, it's, uh, it's a self Yeah. And, and promoting self. Promoting self, focus on self, self-indulgence is how I captured that. Carrie said that, that these behaviors are about me being king. They're not about God being king. They are. That's it, it we can we can detect the self-indulgence in this list of behaviors, right? Self-serving. Right. So what's the opposite way? What's the other way? What do we get? Verse 22. Yes, this, this way of the spirit. And why is it called a fruit? It's a product of growth. Of the spirit. Yeah. And so do I do it by my own willpower? No. I can't. The spirit can produce it in me. What what's my part? To, to listen, to follow, to choose, as Linda said, we have a choice in the battle, right? Okay. We cultivate, right? Is it easy to grow fruit in the garden? In any garden that you have ever done, have you had a super easy time getting fruit to grow? No, right? It takes watering. It takes pruning. Pruning is painful. Sometimes, you know, it takes, uh, James is always, you know, planting some little gardens for us. And we have a little raised bed in the back and then it comes time to thin. And it's like, you just hate to do it, right? You don't want to thin. You want, I want all of those. But for them to have room to grow, you have to thin. There are painful parts of cultivation, right? So the work is done by the spirit. Yet, there's also work to do. It's an already not yet. It's not by me, but by me, right? It's, it's this paradox of the way of the spirit. It blossoms in us naturally. And yet, is it just natural? Will it happen accidentally? No. No. It, it takes our opening ourselves through prayer, through Bible study, through um a choice for the spirit through what we fill our lives with um, as Jerry said right that fruit for that fruit to grow and he says against such things there is no law why is he bringing the law back into it now you've always followed a law the law is finished in that it's fulfilled but all of the good ways of God that were reflected in the law are still the good ways of God, right? We're not anti-law in the anti-goodness of God part, right? Mm -hmm. And so he says that it kind of all comes around, right? He's bringing it full circle. Other questions or comments on that, that portion? I happen to have a reference to Romans 
8, uh, 1 through 4, and it, you know, talks about, um, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death, for what the law was powerless to do, and that was, it was weakened by the sinful nature of flesh. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of flesh, fleshful man, to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin and sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Oh, that, so that was Romans 1, 1, 8, 1 through 4? 1 through 4. So we did y'all hit so many like ding, 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 right? Or didn't we get all of those same concepts? The law of the flesh versus the law of the spirit, the law of Jesus, the, the curse of sin is, you know, Jesus became a curse for us, the death dealing effects of sin, the curse of sin and death. We, we heard in that. Um, so many of those same concepts are beautifully stated in that set of verses. That's great. Yeah. So um, Paul sums it up with his own little summary. Um, and I think uh, we, we hear uh, again, ding, ding, as we hear it. Um, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature, the flesh, with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Um, let us not become conceited, provoking and envying one another. Look, look at this passage. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us walk with, by the Spirit, keep in step by the Spirit. Okay. Keep your eye on that verse, and let me read you Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live. It's the parallel here. But Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, in the body, it's still under, you know, the battle. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. And so that kind of, remember I told you that um, opening at the end of chapter two was sort of a summary, um, a, a pre preview summary. Like it's a, it's, he's wrapping it up before he tells you. So he told you what he was going to tell you. And then he told you, and then he told you what he did tell you, right? Like that, <laughs> that speech model we're seeing up, up here. And so, so that we get this parallel passage, crucified the flesh, Live by the Spirit, keep in step with the Spirit. Additional thoughts or comments? It just occurred to me that we sing a wonderful song where it starts off all of self and none of thee, mm -hmm. and then the progression is all of you and none of me. Yeah, and, and that, um, that idea of all of you and none of me is none of what elements of me? Right, the sinful, the sinful, right, because the me that God created me to be, God wants all of that showing up, right? Mm -hmm. The we see Paul's personality comes through substantially here, doesn't it? Our personalities are, you know, we're not supposed to be robots for Jesus, right? This is not like we don't become not ourselves, we can't become our best self. Right. This is the trap, like uh, the, the idea of authenticity that we often hear in our culture, like you have to be authentic. We do want to be authentic, but not our authentic, sinful, nicer selves. We want to be our authentic spirit led selves in whom the fruit of the spirit has bloomed and grown so that we can be our best selves authentically. One of the things that I was saying is that if you have the spirit, you will have a more fruitful life loving others instead of loving others. Yeah, and this this set of virtues, you know, um, vice and virtue list, very common in ancient philosophy. And we look at this set of virtues and there is no law in any of the cultures against, like these things we recognize as good, 
we recognize these as noble and as worthy of our pursuit. It's not just moral behavior, but it's excellence of character. Excellence of character, in addition to like moral actions that might be on a checklist, but and then and and they go deep into the heart, right? You can't be loving on a checklist, right? If there's the depth there where you authentically act out of the love that imitates the love of Jesus, right? Um, it's because we turn to the spirit that the spirit helps us avoid the acts of the flesh. And then we become who we are and are thereby able to be ambassadors for Christ, right? We, we live in the kingdom where God is king. That's we begin to inherit the kingdom already. And then we, we show the kingdom. The kingdom is, is, um, expanded by the loving way that we behave. Um, and so we see that this like faith and works thing is just not really a dichotomy in here. It's not, it's never faith versus works, is it? Um, we'll talk about this again when we do the wrap up and y'all can sort of meditate on, on what is Galatians about as a whole? Because many people would say faith and works. And I think here we say our practical action flows from the practical action of Jesus Christ. Um, because of the power of the spirit within us. Thank you, everyone. Next lesson, we will continue. This is similar material, really. Um, we're going to do Galatians 6, 1 through 10. And then we'll have a week off for Thanksgiving and then a week for service day. And then we'll wrap up on December 7th with the very last passage and a sort of a, a summary lesson. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Great. Okay, um, we're getting close to our service day. As she said, we have a lesson next week and then off Thanksgiving and the service day. And Barbara has agreed to help us on our Devo there. And uh, so we're all set for that. And we want to thank Leo again for the yummy snacks. And next week, Marie has the prayer and Pam has the snacks. And other announcements? Does anyone have prayer requests for Carrie? Did you get mine, Carrie? I did, but go ahead and tell us oh, okay. the group what's going on there. Well, I, I, I emailed her, but late, so I'm not sure if she saw it. Um, one was from my brother again. Uh, my brother's name is Ray, and he is still at Indy Anderson. Uh, and they were going to do a CT scan on his brain to see if there could, if that would likely be where it would metastasize next. So that was supposed to happen, uh, and they were waiting.